Hello and welcome back here to the video series, The Parasite Journey of the Horse. We have gotten to episode six, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Martin Nielsen. I'm a horse parasitologist here at the University of Kentucky and welcome to my lab. So episode six, so there are five other episodes and if you haven't yet watched them, go back and do that where you found these. We are on a journey through the life of a typical horse, and we're talking about the parasites it encounters in that life. And as you will have learned, there is a time for each parasite. They don't necessarily all occur at the same time. And so here in the sixth episode, we have reached the bots. Now, bots are not worms, but they are parasites. So we're shifting gears here so if the bots aren't worms, what are they then? Well, they're actually insects. And so um, kind of interesting, um, actually very interesting. So we have a few examples of them here. I mean, you probably, if you have horses, you have seen these. Um, kind of gross looking, some would say. Uh, they have this very characteristic appearance, um, you know? Some people actually find them fascinating. And uh, in my country, Denmark, you know, we just like bots so much that we have a candy version of them that you can buy. How about that? And so um, what are the bots in the horses? Well, there is actually a number of different species. <clears throat> there is one that's dominating the picture and then a few others. Two species that we most commonly found, uh, we see in this picture here, the darker looking one is one that's named Gastrophilus intestinalis, and then the lighter looking one is Gastrophilus nasalis. Um, intestinalis is by far the most common one, so most of the time when you see bots, it's from one single species. Uh, there's a few others uh, that are extremely rare and that I almost never see. And so, Let's get right to the life cycle. And uh, there is a slide of that here. And so being an insect, it really is a lot different from the other life cycles that we talk about. So, you know, this, these larvae are gonna end up becoming a fly, a butt fly. Uh, here we have a couple of their old, they're, you know, not in the best of shape, but these are two female butt flies that are mounted on, on a needle. Um, and we see those flies uh, typically in the late part of summer, in most, most areas, most climates, it would be August, September-ish. That's where we see them flying around. And if you have horses, you probably have seen these hovering around. They, they buzz, they kind of sound like mini helicopters uh, in a way. And some horses, by the way, actually do not like these flies. Some are even terrified uh, by them and they would do whatever they can to kick them or try to run away from them. Now, what the horses don't know is that these flies are actually harmless. They never land on the horse and they don't sting or bite. And they basically don't even have the mouth parts to do so. They kind of look like a, a, a big bee or something. And, and that might be why the horses are reacting. But these female flies, are laying their eggs while hanging in the air and they glue these yellow eggs onto the hair coat of the horse and you have probably all seen these eggs here's a piece of dried uh, leather skin with the hair intact and you see those yellow eggs on it um, and we can also look at a picture here where you see basically the same on a leg of a horse and so these eggs can be found essentially all over the body of the horse you typically find them on the legs the shoulders, the neck, the withers, sometimes the main hair, sometimes the flanks, where you see these glued on. Now, horses get infected while grooming. These eggs hatch when uh, they're breathed upon. And so uh, that's what, what activates the hatching and the larvae will come out. Now, when I say grooming, I need to emphasize that, well, as you know, horses can be grooming themselves and thereby infecting themselves with these larvae, but they also tend to groom each other. So, you know, if you're in the game of removing air, eggs from your horses uh, to basically reduce that source of infection, be aware that 
the herd mates uh, would also have those eggs. So it needs to be a concerted effort uh, for that to be effective. Now, once the larvae get inside the mouth of the horse, they hang out there for a while. Um, they actually have a couple things that they do. They first migrate through the tongue. So they burrow into the tissue, to the flesh of the tongue, and they dig little tunnels there. Um, most of the time we don't see any lesions, uh, any discomfort associated with that, but in some cases you can see that. You can see those lesions. When they make it to the base of the tongue, at the very back of the mouth, they come up from their tunnels and they look around and they go, all right, where to go next? And then they say, well, you know, uh, those big teeth, those molars there in the cheek of the horse, that might be a good place to hang out for a while. And they go there. And so uh, we can look at the picture here where you see that larva, that circle right there along those teeth. That's where it's hanging out. And it's convenient because there's a lot of food passing by and they just grab it as it's coming by and then they have plenty of nutrients to do what they're interested in doing, which is grow and get bigger. Um, actually, these lesions, uh, you can see on this skull uh, as well. Um, they actually leave a little bit of a crater in the bone. Uh, so look at that hole there. Can you see that? Yeah. So these will heal uh, quite well, actually. But um, we can just talk about what the implications are for discomfort when we get to the disease section in a little bit. So once they've been hanging out there uh, and crawling around in the mouth for a while, typically roughly maybe three weeks or so, then they move on to their final destination, which is the stomach. Now, different species will have different places in the stomach that they like to hang out. So they basically just sort of, you know, they say, well, I'm doing my thing over here, this is my area, and then you can hang out over there on the other side of that fence. That's kind of how they do it. So they try to divvy up uh, the different parts so they don't compete directly with each other. And then they attach to the wall of the stomach and essentially, all they do there is, first of all, they grow. So they go from, from small stages to uh, somewhat bigger stages. And that's where, again, they need their delivery, their, their catering service to be intact. And that's very, very effective right there in the stomach. Lots and lots of food coming down. And, and then they can do exactly what they need, which is grow. And then the other point of hanging out there in the stomach is that their goal is really just to make it to the next spring. They don't want to be out there in the winter where it's cold, where it's uh, rainy or snowy, and where it's just not a good environment for insects to be flying around. So they're going to just make it through the winter. And could you think of a better place to do that than inside the stomach of the horse where, as I already said, all the food gets delivered to it. Pretty smart. So they actually hang out for several months. And then typically by springtime or early summer, that's when these will then come out. They'll come out into the environment, they'll, they'll fall on the ground, and then they'll, they'll just lay there and they will actually pupate and uh, become a cocoon. And then out of that cocoon, the final fly will then emerge. And as I already said, she'll be coming out in late summer. Um, and then the life cycle is complete. So that's about the life cycle. So how common are these bots? Well, I have to say they are extremely common. They are extremely normally occurring. It is absolutely no surprise to be finding bots. There is some seasonality to it. So if you're in the winter, early spring, uh, or even late spring, you will see these coming out and a lot of people will start noticing. Or if you just dewormed your horse during that time of year, uh, late fall, winter, early spring, you'll see a lot of these come out if you use the dewormer that has activity against bots. And I'll also get to that in a little bit. So these are not unusual, but you will not see them in the middle of the summer uh, or early fall just because they will not have established yet. And there are times of the year where, uh, where horses might get bots or might have them, but they're still only at that oral stage. So, so I like to say that all horses get bots. However, you know, just as an interesting observation, I have two herds of horses that I use in my research. We study them 
Uh, we call them the historic Hertz because they've been around at the University of Kentucky uh, for over 40 years and have been studied and we've used them to document and teach us a lot about the parasites. One herd is a horse herd and another herd is a miniature herd um, of horses and they're about the same si size, 20 horses each. There are those full arrivings every year in both of those herds. Now in the horse herd we see bots all the time in all the horses and sometimes in very high numbers now uh, completely unaffected by them but that's what we see in the minis in the miniature horses we almost never see any bots at all and those two herds are on the very same farm same climate same management i don't know why these bots just don't like uh minis miniature horses i mean who does not like something like this what's wrong with these bots i'm just asking so like I said, there might be reasons why bots don't like to get into very little and cute horses, I don't know, or whether there's any other factors affecting uh, where the bots might be found, but don't be surprised if you find bots in your horse. Now, let's talk about disease. What do these actually cause in the horses? Now, the stomach stage, however gross it is looking, and I agree, uh, you can see another picture here. You know, sometimes if you have a gastroscopy done on your horse because your veterinarian is wondering whether your horse could be having a stomach ulcer, you might see these. They're like sitting there, they're wriggling and waving at you. They're going, oh, hi, yeah, we're just hanging out here. Um, they do not cause stomach ulcers. And it's sort of weird because you would think that it must do something. You know, look at them, they're gross. They, they do attach to that wall and there must be some kind of lesion. And there is, but those lesions heal and they are not classified as stomach ulceration uh, by the definition that we have. And we don't see discomfort associated with it. The other thing that people have investigated a lot is, can these eat their way all the way through the abdominal wall and make a hole through to the other side? And no, for some reason, they don't do that either. They must just sort of know how far to go and they stay right there on that surface. Now, uh, never rule out that in some extreme cases, bots might cause some discomfort in horses, but as a general rule, they really don't. They look gross, but they basically don't do anything bad. Now, let's get back to what's happening here in the mouth. So talking about the larvae that are migrating first through the tongue and then they sit here alongside those molars, those teeth, for a lengthy period of time. Um, has that been associated with any discomfort? And yes, it has. There are a couple studies that have documented an association with soreness in the mouth in some horses. And so um, it it's, is interesting to note that, you know, some of these horses get a lot of these and you see very, very, very few of those types of lesions. And if they're there, they heal very quickly. So talk to your equine dentist um, and veterinarian and ask them whenever they float your horse's teeth, how often they actually see these lesions uh, and whether they've ever seen them in your horse. Now, uh, they may have seen them, uh, but in many cases, I assure you, they say, well, most of the time, everything just looks normal. This is just like a rare finding. And so, um, but perhaps these bots, if they ever do anything and they ever, you know, affect your horse, it might be while they're in the mouth more so than when they are in the stomach. Now, you're dying to, to hear how you can deworm these and get rid of them, right? Okay, so let's get to that section. Treatment. I have good news for you. Bots have not been found resistant to equine dewormers. So if you treat, it will work. Now, be careful though. Equine dewormers do not necessarily work against bots. They are primarily designed to work against worms. And I, rem I told you, bots are not worms. So most dewormers only work against worms. Some work against both worms and insects, and in some cases, mites as well. Those dewormers are ivermectin and moxidectin. So ivermectin, moxidectin, and similar products do have activity against bots as well as worms. I should emphasize that of the two, ivermectin and moxidectin, 
Ivermectin has the better effect against the bots. Moxidectin works as well, but it is more variable in terms of how many of the bots it eliminates, while Ivermectin usually gets all of them if you do deworm. Now, one thing I say about treatment for bots is that we should not let bots dictate our parasite control program. By that I mean there are much more important parasites that should be taken into account when we decide our tra uh, parasite treatment strategy. Those more important parasites are the strongyles, both the small and the large. They are the tapeworms and they are the ascarids in the younger animals. And so go back and watch those videos if you haven't done already. The bots are far down that list. And I also emphasize that if you follow current recommendations, a lot of you would be deworming your horse in the fall anyway. And in a lot of cases, you would be deworming your horse with either an ivermectin or moxidectin product. If you do that, you will, as a bonus, also get the bots. And then you have nothing to worry about. So you can get those bots treated as a, an extra benefit uh, as part of the program that you would be using anyway. And also, forget about the thing with the killing frost. Don't wait for the first frost uh, in order to treat these bots. There's no point. Well, yes, there will not be any bot flies flying around after the first frost, but they're gone long before then. And um, waiting until the first frost for the other parasites in many cases can be a little too late in the year. So don't use that frost thing. It's an old myth that is really not founded in any evidence or much at all. So um, ivermectin and moxidectin for treatment of bots. So that's the end of this video. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and um, let's wrap this up. What do I want to leave you with? Bots, the parasites that sell like candy and apparently don't like small and cute looking minis. With that, I'll leave you for today and who knows if there might be a next video coming up if that is the case, I'll see you there. Thank you.